welcome to the Shellonomics Podcast, presented by King Mictus, your ultimate source for pure Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles entertainment. Stay tuned and dive deep into the Turtleverse with us. Catch all the action on YouTube and Twitch for non-stop Ninja Turtles adventures and retro gaming thrills. King Mike and the heroes in a half shell. What is up, guys? Shellonomics episode 14. I am here with Isaac, part of the Ninja Turtle documentary, Evolution, Mutation, and Reboot. So, Isaac, what is your earliest Ninja Turtle memories? My earliest memory, to be honest, is um, is going over to my neighbor's house. I mean, so it's just classic. It's classic. Everybody in that, that age bracket, as you know, we all have similar memories where, you know, we discovered the, the turtles through friends or through a, through through TV or through the toys. I do remember being taken over maybe about four, four years old uh, to my neighbor's house, maybe even younger than that. And uh, I guess maybe 89. Yeah. I was about four years old. So I, I was taken over there and like being in the sandbox and being kind of shy and there was bigger kids with them and they all had these, these toys and everybody had turtle toys. And it's my earliest member memory of seeing them and really, really wanting those. I really wanted to play with what they were playing with. And I think I, I, I vaguely remember my mom having to be like, you know, is there one that Isaac could use? You know, like, you know, the shy kid, the mom has to come over and sort of help help you uh, get get in with the, with the kids. So I remember being given like I think it was like a, a metalhead toy and and be like, OK, fine. Give the kid the robot one. Um, <laughs> and then I went and I think it was like probably that week I went and got like a Donatello at the, the hardware store with like rolled up coins. Um, you know, like rolled up my, my dimes and quarters and went and got one. And, and I think my dad, even at the time was like, you know what, there's like, there's like 10 figures in this, in this line. Let's, let's, you know, let's help them build a thing. So, you know, my fifth birthday, everybody got me turtles and I thought that was the craziest thing ever. And then, you know, the rest is history, man. So I want to bring this up again. Now you, you're the second person that told me actually on these uh, podcasts, that you actually got your first toy from a hardware store. So turtle toys, yeah. again, just to confirm, I'm, I just, I'm still shocked over that. Wow. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it is. I mean, I'm in Canada here, and I don't know how how much it was like this in the states. But there's a um, there was a chain of hardware stores that's still around called Home Hardware, and they oftentimes had toys. They had like a toy section. Um, so it'd be like you know household gardening, different things in the in the hardware store, plus like you know general hardware. And there was a toy section usually. Um, in in, the, in my little in my little local town here, there was one, and that actually at one point had the toy section in the basement. You would go down the stairs and find all your toys. Very interesting. Now, before we get into the documentary, I was just curious, like, did you always have a passion for film? And did you ever, like, do any uh, turtle projects growing up? Like, were you shooting, like, a, a fanfic or some sort of, like, uh, films like that when you were growing up? When I was a kid, I, I did, I, I, I developed an interest in film really early on. Um, I did have, it's funny because a lot of, you know, filmmakers, like, you know, big, you know, Hollywood kind of filmmakers yeah. that, who grew up in the 70s or earlier will have memories of having film cameras, like real film, eight millimeter film cameras. And I, I was, I'm obviously way younger than that generation. I was born in 85. So I did stumble across a film camera, an eight millimeter film camera, and they had long since stopped making film for those. But I did somehow that the local photography guy found us a roll of unused eight millimeter film and I would do stop motion films with toys now my first stop motion films with toys would have been playmobile toys i did have turtles but i wasn't using them that way and later as a, as a you know maybe a 10 or 11 year old we used to make a lot of um of videos like you know home videos with gi joes because they you could tie strings to their shoulders and, and make them kind of like marionettes it was very it was very proto uh, uh team america um but the uh <laughs> Uh, but but truth be told, I didn't do that with with turtle toys. Now that said, I remember when I was a little bit older, uh, just probably getting start, you know, getting close to getting out of toys, but maybe not because I liked playing with toys all the way until I was like thirteen. Um, I the gargoyles had come out, and I really wanted gargoyle toys. So we would cut out cardboard wings and tape them to the back of turtles. <laughs> I awesome. look like turtles. So, random. Do you still have any of those uh, short films of the GI Joes? Are they on VHS tape somewhere? On like a oh, yeah. real? Oh, that's oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. They, they, we, we've got tons of them, and they they got more elaborate as we went on. We would start like, we would be like, 
So we would do it inside with potted plants and stuff because it was probably winter in Canada or yeah. whatever. And then we then outside in the summer, we would like do these elaborate things through the garden and like chop down half the, the garden, which is funny. And then we would like for explosions, we would bury a stick with a string attached to it. And you would like pull it out really fast. You didn't see the stick. You would just see this like poof explosion <laughs> with like dirt flying you know mortar hits and stuff i wonder if toy story <laughs> checked you guys out when they were kids to see the, all these combat carls getting blown up <laughs> that's right yeah but we, we didn't in canada it was hard it's it was by the time i was growing up it was really hard to get firecrackers so if we drove to florida we would like stop in tennessee to get firecrackers now be like hiding them going over the border going oh no don't let the border yeah. police stop us with our firecrackers <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! So and, and nowadays with people with the toys, they do those uh, stop motion films too. Now with those, which are incredible. I don't know, I, I in, insane how technology's come so far since, like you say, we were born in the '80s. So what inspired you and your friends to actually create this first uh, Turtle Power documentary for us fans? Um, back to before I went to film school when I was coming out of high school and I wanted to get into film as a business, and I was working at a video production company in a city near, near where I grew up. And they had done sort of these like direct to the video, direct to DVD or VHS still um, history or not even history, but they were like everybody who collected snowmobiles, like these antique snowmobiles, very Canadian. So there's these antique snowmobile clubs and they would do these videos and it was called classic sleds. And it'd be like, people who would make videos of classic car, car, you know, clubs and stuff. So they did these like direct video, direct a video, you know, mail out, buy your own copy of classic sleds, talking to snowmobile collectors and talking about old stuff. So I had this idea of doing a documentary like that on Toyota Land Cruisers, like the four by four Land Cruisers and legendary vehicle all over the world, you know, best four by four ever made that kind of thing. And I wanted to go and do this thing. And I was 19 years old and I borrowed some money and flew all across Canada and then all across the United States, like, like did a big circle from, you know, coast to coast in both countries and did, you know, clubs in the mountains and collectors and that kind of thing. And so I made this film and I sold it through magazine advertisements and got it on some broadcasts and stuff. And so when I went to film school, I thought, well, I, I'm pretty cool because I've done this film. And so I went through film school with the intention of doing narrative movies as a director and a cinematographer. And then coming out of that, during film school, I started revisiting the things that we like when we're kids. And that's what you know oftentimes happens in your 20s. And so I took this idea of this Land Cruiser documentary idea and said, well, what if, what if I did the history of the Ninja Turtles? Because that was my favorite brand growing up. And it has seems to have a really interesting backstory of what I can find on the internet. I didn't know who Kevin and Peter were when I was five years old or six years old, but it has this really interesting backstory that would make a great film. So I had started working with um, two two filmmakers from my hometown, uh, and they um, basically they we had discussed the idea of what if we did this this turtle thing, and um, they. Uh, uh, they were like, well, I don't know. That sounds pretty risky. I don't know if it'll work. Uh, but basically, you know, I kept bugging them until we said, let's do this. And, and we kind of, we kind of came up with the idea of, of, of doing a fan film like this, uh, where we would interview fans and stuff, but really quickly it took on a life of its own and became, okay, now we've got Kevin and Peter. Now we've got the voice cast. Now we've got, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the Hensons. Now we've got, you know, like it just, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. So it was a crazy process. Yeah, and just t- and, and they weren't really going to comic cons back then either, right? The voice actors, I think you said that in other shows, like that was like a reunion of all the old cartoon voices, right? When you guys brought them together. That's right. Yeah, I mean, really, it was actually interesting. Um, time was like late two thousand eight, early two thousand nine. There were comic, obviously, comic cons since back yeah. in the seventies, but but there wasn't that the fan culture hadn't caught up to those brands like Turtles or. Or, or other brands of the 80s and 90s, yet there wasn't really that big push. I guess Transformers was out in cons and stuff at the time, probably by that point, but but there, they had really not done anything like that yet. So when we did um, Turtle Power 1, it was, we were kind of kind of a bit of a head, head of the curb. There wasn't any other pop culture docs. There wasn't any other um, things like that. So yeah, the, the voice cast, that was really the first time they had got back together. Obviously, since then, they've done 
dozens of appearances together. But now, you know, well, the truth is when we finished, when we, before we finished Real Power 1, James Avery had already passed away and, and now, you know, P. Leonard is gone. So yeah, like, it, it, you can't even do the whole gang anymore. Yeah, which is just a blessing how you guys got them together. And just and it seemed like, you know, so I want to actually talk about this first one again. So the DVD is almost like a collector's item now, right? Because I've heard that one only had one print. And for those yeah. who are looking to find this to get pumped for the second one, I think currently, though, it is on Paramount, I believe. It's on their streaming set, right? If they want to watch the first one so they can still watch yeah. it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think you can rent it on YouTube. I think you can watch it on Paramount+. Plus. I think it's still on iTunes. It's it's findable. You can you can definitely watch okay. it out there. Yeah, I do encourage all to watch that one because the reason behind the second one is they just filmed and filmed and filmed. So I want to do a little quick timeline before we dig deep into this second one. So me yeah. and Isaac are a part of a Ninja Turtle fan site called the Technodrome. I, me and him have been on there for almost 15, 16 years. That's where Turtle yeah. fans would talk before Facebook groups and Reddit groups. So we've got a post here from April the 1st, and a lot of us thought it was an April Fool's joke from the Canadian turtle himself. And I'll read it right here. It says, Greeting peoples of the drone. After two years of pushing, prodding, and yes, pleading, the definitive film team has finally gotten the go-ahead to dive back into the sewers for Turtle Power Volume 2. We now have the chance to pick up where we left off, showcasing even more turtle history while bringing you as much new content as we can get our hands on. To that end, we're planning on sell a pre-sell campaign that will allow fans the chance to get their hands on exclusive special features. Bonus content was desperately want we wanted to include in the first volume, but we're unable to. Then we're going to fast forward now, guys. This is April 1st, 2016. A lot of fans on that group were, you know, trying to encourage, like, are we getting updates? Myself, Michelle Ivey were on there writing. Then we go to August 14th, 2019. Some of you might yep. be wondering where the second Turtle Power film is. Well, let me tell you, at risk of sounding like a broken record, we got stuck in politics again which is often the yeah. case with documentaries like this. There was a deal in the works, the doc was at it and ready to go, and then that deal slowly melted away, and we find ourselves back at square one again. So uh, do you want to touch on that at all? Is that okay to share with us? Like, uh, what happened? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah basically, I mean, that, that's, not, that's not uncommon okay. at all, like with these things. I mean, Hollywood moves at a glacial pace. Um, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're, I think that, I think the public is becoming more savvy to the frustrations around their the brands and stuff that they want to see like yeah. everybody has been waiting for he-man film right. has been waiting forever i don't sure if it's i think they finally are starting to cast the darn thing uh you know there's several you know things like that where you, you just things fall apart people move on from one company to the next you have to start over again all of all the time okay now a whole new people group of people are the or the ones we're trying to sell to so yes there was a moment there um we did start shooting pretty much day one as we delivered Turtle Power One. We had we had that opportunity to reunite Kevin and Peter. That turned into this amazing piece of footage that that we're like, well, what do we do with this? We can't put it in, in the first one. The first one's already delivered. They had reunited together. We had got this like hour and a half of them reminiscing of of their whole history on that property at Dover, and that was amazing. And then we said, okay, well. Here's all the other stuff we haven't done. So, like, like, like I said in that post, a couple of years on, we had all the stuff that we hadn't fit into the first film, stuff we had continued shooting, and then Nickelodeon finally said, "Yeah, you know what? Come on back in. Now come in, and we'll let you see the whole fifth season of the the Ciro Nelly show, the 2012 series, and the beginning of Rise." So there was this indication that that all of this was going to land at Nickelodeon. There would be a, because that's all tied to Paramount and Viacom, so we would be able to land there. Um, unfortunately, it just didn't work. It just didn't transpire uh, for no specific fault of anybody's. It's just politics, and it's slow, and it this happens, that happens. They refresh, they reset. New new people come in, old people go out. Deals are made, they're gone. Um, we've seen it happen a hundred times with different franchises we're involved with. So it was no surprise. Yet it's always frustrating when you're. To try to develop and maintain a relationship within a fan community to say, hey guys, you know, yeah, we started Turtle Power 15 years ago now. Um, you know, yes, we'll eventually do more. And it's, you know, people, I think even since then, you know, since even 2016, have gotten more and more and more and more and more used to getting all the content they want for free on YouTube, right? Everything yep. is there. Um, all the video essays that are out there that have taken Turtle Power 1, cut it into pieces, retold the history a hundred times. And, and I mean, that, that's a different model. We never went that model. We were all, we were more in the traditional film sense. So 
that's what we do is expensive because we're traveling all over the world and we're going to these people's houses. It's different than taking content from the internet, remixing it, re-recording a voiceover and putting it out. So the can audiences of everything, whether you're watching the golf channel or history of He-Man, they're used to just going and getting stuff for free. So the, the, everything changed to a point where it become, became very hard to sell a movie that cost a lot of money to make into a distribution system. So that's where we just said, you know, listen, it's not that they don't get it. It's not that they don't like what we're doing. They're just, everybody's stuck. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows how to get anything out anymore. And it, it, it's just a changing landscape. So that's why we said, on the side, I've been developing a toy company, a toy manufacturing company, and um, and we, we, we can create stuff like books and everything like that. So we said, let's just deliver our film as a massive film. We'll not even do a short version. We'll just do a big four-hour four hour version. We'll offer all of the bonus features we've ever collected, um, and all of our, our archives as bonus features that we've ever collected, and then put that out to the world in a big Kickstarter. You, you know, make a book make toys and, and do one big sort of last hurrah, which I know personally, I know that once we release all these, these archives, they're going to go out to the fan community and they're going to be repurposed into YouTube videos. That's what's, what's going to happen. So really this is our way of saying, okay, everybody, this is your last chance to kind of get all of this from us all, you know, in one place. And hopefully, you know, hopefully they come out to support that because yes, it's expensive. And we know that a lot of people have kind of, been complaining about well this blu-ray is really expensive well it's like a four or five disc set and if you want the bonus features it's like a 12 or 13 disc set it's huge so it's, it's expensive to produce the economy is hard so things are expensive to to make and the toys we're literally making tooling and injection mold processes to um to manufacture these toys domestically because if if you're NECA and you're going to order five thousand units from overseas that's that's um you know that's one way to do it um, so, but we're not, we're not them. We're only doing a few hundred, um, units and that few hundred units costs a lot more to produce if you're only doing a few hundred. So I'm getting into the weeds. I know, but that's sort of the direction we are, which is why I'm wearing rubber gloves because yep. I'm going to show you this stuff. Eventually. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah, so just to finish that. Yeah. So again, yeah, for those, all due respect for those, you know, uh, researchers on YouTube, like you say, they kind of, I mean, not all, but some, they, they just Wikipedia screenshot an image and just read off, you know. And uh, site, but again, for those who have never watched the first doc, just to get a sneak peek of the passion and dedication these guys have, there's a spot in there where they talk about the first movie, and they actually have the gentleman who created the studio design sets there, and he shows you it's like there are there are real artifacts in you know these documentaries here. So I do encourage all to, you know at least watch that first one, and then stop on by Kickstarter, which is where we're going to get to next. So fast forward 2023, the first trailer's out, and now officially September 24th. Uh, September 14th, 2024, you guys have the Kickstarter. So can you just quickly explain what Kickstarter is? Because a lot of us are, you know, in our 40s and 50s, and some people are, <laughs> uh, may have never heard of Kickstarter before. So, 100%. You know what? It's a, it's a great question. I appreciate that you asked that because the truth is that it it is you take it for granted what it is, and then and then when you're kind of putting the message out, you realize quickly, oh, we have to do a bit of education in a way yeah. to, to, to help people understand what it is. And so to be, to go right down to the root of it, Kickstarter was a platform, much like any platform on the internet developed to help things, things, anything you can think of become a reality from small producers. So it wasn't about pre-ordering your favorite toy. It wasn't about pre-ordering a product per se. It was about, Somebody coming on like me saying, I'm going to develop a toy company. Can you help me make the toy company happen? And this is what I'm going to give you as a reward. And if you help me build a toy company, I'm going to give you product as a reward. And that product is hopefully something you think is cool. So whether I'm making a thing for your bicycle or a new toaster oven um, or a film or a board game or a music or a movie, you can go to a platform like Kickstarter and said, I want to make this world. I want to write this book. Do you want to help me do that? And people pledge at different tiers, we call them like reward levels of going, you know what? I'll give you a buck or I'll give you five bucks. And that as you go up that pledge amount, you get bigger rewards. Maybe you get a thank you at a certain level. Maybe you get a poster at a certain level. Maybe you get 
um, the physical product like a toy or a movie at a higher level. So what is confusing about Kickstarter to any backer, a person who even likes Kickstarter or knows Kickstarter already, anybody who comes in and backs the project, you'll see this sort of menu like a restaurant. You'll see like, okay, I can get the steak and I can get the steak with eggs and I can get the steak with eggs and fries and I can get the steak with eggs and fries and a drink. So you see these levels. Well, behind that, there's also, you know what? You can also get a side salad and you can also get dessert. So there's like these extra pieces that you can, we call them add-ons. So the way we've tried to design our Kickstarter, which is confusing because we're not doing just a film. We're not doing just a book. We're not doing just toys. We're doing all three. So that becomes even more confusing because we're not just one thing. So when we do that, you, you basically look at it as uh, a way to try to explain to people that there is an a la carte option. You can start at a dollar and go into the back end of the cart and go, I want this, 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 and this, and build your cart the way you want it, or you just want one thing or whatever. So that's where a lot of people come up to our Kickstarter if they haven't experienced Kickstarter before, and they go, holy cow, this was expensive. Because the other thing, too, is that the images are listed in Canadian dollars, and that's just by the fact that we live in Canada. Okay. Whereas if you look at the where you're going to order, it will automatically convert those to American dollars, because uh, let's, let's admit it, 90% of the backers will be from the United States. So the that is a first barrier of frustration where we kind of have to place it that way otherwise we would have to update the conversion rate on our graphics every day which is impossible so you just try to say listen this is 200 dollars in canadian dollars written right there remember american dollars are less like meaning they're valued more so it will look uh, uh it would be like 180 dollars instead of 200 dollars right um so that's one that's one of the kind of elements of it so kickstarter is a method to help a company develop a thing. And then in reward, you whether it's a few months or, or within a year afterwards, you get the reward. Now we did make a mistake for those who have pointed it out. For some of our reward tiers say that it will be fulfilled or delivered in two years. That was a mistake that okay. the date was left in wrong. Once somebody backs a reward, you can't edit it. You can't change the title. You can't say you get a different thing. You can't put a different date. So it was a mistake. So anyway, within a year, we have to deliver the film, the bonus features, the book, and the, the figures. Now, in our case, you know, this is a mock-up. It's not the real one, but here's a Blu-ray. Yeah, It'll, It'll be like, like four discs for just the movie. You can get a digital version of this only, a digital screening only, or a digital download only. So you can do different levels. So where people go, I don't know if I can afford $85 Canadian for a four-disc set, you can also back it at like $30 and just get a digital one, right? So there's a lot of ways in that you can still partake or participate. And then as you go up, then you get into these guys where we get into figures. Yes. And these, these are pretty cool. So, so really, and uh, with the Kickstarter, actually, uh, Michelle Ivy, I'm sure you're familiar with her. She's in your first documentary. She actually had a Kickstarter for a Cowabunga Corner years ago on there, and it actually hit. So it is a great yeah. way to help out just passionate people who are looking to, you know, help us Turtle fans get education on, you know, what we love and to dig a little deeper. So, I do want to say congratulations. If you guys do go to their Kickstarter, the main goal has hit, which is awesome. Uh, there's a whole yeah. bunch of other goals on there. Real quick, though, too, is I watched the trailer, and just for guys like myself, I'm a hard copy guy. Digital's cool, but I just like, you know, I grew up at Nintendo, you know, Super. I like yeah. having my hard copy. And in the trailer, yeah, it says the Kickstarter is the only way to claim a physical copy. Is that correct? You can't guarantee this is going to be released at Target, Walmart, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right? Okay. We can't, we, can't, we can't guarantee it. It doesn't go beyond it at all. So this is your, your first way. And the only thing I could say is possible is that, and this is something that, that somebody brought up in a question today, actually, yeah. is that they go, okay, let's say we go and we want to make the, the disc. And let's say, for argument's sake, we've sure. only um, ordered 500, for yeah. argument's sake. But let's say the printer says, you know what? It's cheaper if you order a thousand, and then you go, okay, well, we'll have five hundred extra. So maybe that's not exactly sure. what's going to happen. Right. But maybe we have some overrun, and maybe we put the overrun on a website for a different dollar figure. But that's otherwise this four-hour unedited massive release. It's not going to end up in streaming. Uh, it is what it is. Is the way to get it, and and the and the, specifically, especially with the toys. And yes, again, the toys are at a higher price point than we want them to be. But again, we're developing literally a factory to make them without going overseas. So, um, yeah, there is there is a – and you did bring up a good point there with rewards. With Kickstarter, all Kickstarters, you set a goal. Your base goal, let's say it's $100. Let's say it's $100,000. You, If you don't go over the first goal, you don't 
the backer doesn't get charged anything. So the person who is backing it, if we didn't read it, reach a hundred dollars or sort of hundred thousand dollars Canadian, which was our goal, nobody would have got charged a penny, right? We wouldn't have made anything. They wouldn't have got charged. It wouldn't have happened. The moment you go over that amount, that means everybody's locked in. We have to make it. They have to get a, 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 a reward and they, they are pledging that amount. So once you go past the goal, the initial goal, then you have an opportunity to do what's called stretch goals, which you pointed out, which is to say, okay, if we get to this much money, we can afford to make it better. If we get to this much money, we can add more pages in the book. Or one of the stretch goals we just passed was the Steve Barron commentary, because we have a good chunk of the movie, the first movie's dailies, which is the raw footage from the first movie. And we said, well, what if we had Steve Barron come in and do it like a Zoom, like we're doing right now, yeah. and... And we'll go through all those dailies and we'll talk about all the alternate takes and what scenes were left out, what didn't happen, what did they do, why didn't they do this, what was it like that day? And we can go through all those dailies for like an hour and a half, Steve and I, and we'll deliver that as a, a, an add-on bonus feature um, to say, okay, everybody, here you go. That, that This is Steve literally reminiscing about all those elements. One of the things we're going to add today actually is a poster because somebody said, hey, you've got Steve Barron doing commentary can you get him to sign some posters yeah, yeah we're gonna do a poster and you can get him to sign some that'll be something you can add to your cart after the fact so so we're actually b b building those into the campaign as well and so the figures were another one where there are i don't have the other one sitting here on the table but some of the alternative bad guys if we do get to a certain point of, of however many those are ordered we're going to add more of the alternative universe bad guys which were from uh, the first playmates pitch internally where they were going to make all of shredders bad guys um humans instead of mutants but the the primary ones are the are the kevin and peters i've actually never shown these to the world yet as oh, color nice. the, the first time they've actually shown up in color is on kevin's oh, um, those look fantastic uh, facebook yeah so these are, these are just the the 3d printed prototypes as um was just a um a, a first a first like test paint by hand just to see what it would look like you try to figure out how many colors each one's going to get on it because it's called paint tops so like how many colors you have to paint each toy um, one of the things that was really exciting to show that I haven't shown this to yeah, anybody who's going to get um, a release video, I think, tomorrow um, is the uh, articulate, which is why I'm wearing gloves. I've been wearing gloves the whole time because these are really sticky. I just took them out of the kicks, uh, the, um, to the uh, 3D printer. printer. So when you're making a toy that's articulated, as I'm sure everybody knows, they all split apart. So you need to develop all the parts so that they, and I actually haven't done this yet, so I don't know if this is going to fit. This is everybody for world's first. We're going to see nice. if Kevin's articulation actually fits um because this is the, the first test of um of putting together the uh how a toy goes together right so you have to have the the buck which is the center piece of their body is uh, is split in half we're doing disc joints which is slightly different in the hips than the original one so now now kevin is missing his front he's like a terminator so we'll sandwich that together with the back Look at that. Oh, man. Yeah. Badass. Right? Now watch this. Watch this. <laughs> Fresh out of the oven <laughs> and it works. This is the first time. His head turns. Wow. The first time I tested that. So I wasn't sure if that was going to work. <laughs> and we're live, too. So nicely done. Oof, way to go, Kevin. Coming through in a clinch. <laughs> he did. He's working. That is awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, so guys, if you check out the Kickstarter, you'll be able to actually buy a set of those. And the toys he's talking about is, and this was actually mentioned in your first documentary. I believe there's like a sit-down discussion with Peter and Kevin talking to guys. And they actually have a figure that you guys have on this Kickstarter. If they check out the documentary first and then go to Kickstarter with like a snot nose kind of bebop. I know he was featuring yeah. the first, and it's yeah. actually going to be a toy they can get, right? Absolutely right. So so when, you're right. So in the first documentary, we, we discovered for the first time ever this whole stack of Designs because what happens obviously is when Kevin and Peter uh, show up at Playmates Toys. Playmates Toys is going to design what the toys are going to look like and what's going to be in the cartoon because they remember paid for the first five episodes, right? So they have to hire uh, an animation company. They have to design what's going to be in the show. How do we adapt or you know adapt or mutate uh, the comic book to a toy line and a cartoon? So that first year of pitches within the company they said okay here's a whole line of bad guys okay we got the sweater guy and he's gonna have a whole bunch of wacky characters from new york uh, uh, a, a a a mechanic who's got a wrench for an arm and a football player with a robot leg and you know a garbage man who has like a garbage thing and what if they have gross humor like snot nose guns that 
have tubes into noses, and the sewer is going to have a face in the wall that looks like a slime job of the hut. And so they had all these ideas, and nobody had ever seen them. And the only reason that we knew they existed is that Peter recorded the whole meeting on his camera. He actually put a camera on the end of the table, and for an hour and 40 minutes of that day, I mean, there was a lot of days they were there, but that one hour and 40 minutes, they sat there and went through everything on camera. So you saw these drawings for the first time in that footage. And John Handy, the designer that worked at Playmates Toys at the, initially at the time on Turtles, um, sent me a box he found in his garage. He had actually found all of those original drawings. So that was the first time that those had ever been released. So that's why when we did this, we did the second doc and we said, let's do toys. We thought, what if we did those alternate bad guys that never saw the light of day? Nobody even knows they exist other than in the documentary and yeah. the Rad Plastic book. You know, what if we did those in a Playmate style and you could get them uh, and put them with your with your turtle figures and that that would be like, what if we had done this instead of Bebop and Rocksteady? <laughs> so that's why we did Kevin and Peter as, as Playmates toys and as um, we're going to keep them also in the natural. So this is Kevin as a, kind of a natural figure and Kevin as a, as a Playmate style figure. So we are going to produce these two. So we're doing both the styles. Uh, so when you back it on Kickstarter, at the very end of the campaign, you'll get a survey that says, do you want this version or this version of Kevin and Peter? And they will both be articulated. They'll both be on the card. They'll both be painted. Uh, and then if you wanted both sets, you could just add two of two sets in your cart. And then when you get to the end, it'll be like, do you want this one and this one? Or do you want two of this one or two of this one? You know what I mean? So it'll give you that option at the end to figure out which, which style you want. So that, And the reason we did that is because when Steve Varner... The original turtle sculptor who sculpted these with us um, sent this. It was like, well, this is more like a little bit more like a Star Wars style figure, right? Mm -hmm. But it looks really great. And people were like, hey, I like that. Can we get that as well? Because like this is the same height, but it looks radically different because that's the style that Playmates was doing things in. So we definitely wanted to do this because this is the style that goes with the old ones. But we're like, let's do this too. So. Yeah. Um, and I definitely want people yeah. to check out the Kickstarter because you even have the card back, just like the old Playmates toys too, which is a really cool design for these toys too. Yeah, really well done. Uh, real quick about the the original movie again, because in the first doc, there's a really cool deleted scene with Shredder, like taking on his own like you know clan, so to speak. Yep. And you just said you're gonna actually have if, if the goal hits, you'll have, you'll be chatting with Steve Barron. Um, for the documentary here, are there gonna be more deleted scenes in regards to that? Um, like the barn fight, do you, can you confirm if there's going to be more? Because that's what me and Michelle were talking about in the first episode where, you know, she knows a little more than, you know, the basic fans do. But do you have more scenes when that fight with Michelangelo with the blindfold and they're like, you know, so, combating it by the farm? Yeah. So so that that's legendary. Like, you know, yeah. people have, um, when um, uh, the old Turtle Den did a video of us on YouTube, um, for help with the promotion of the campaign uh, about a week or two ago now. And I let him see some of the, the raw footage we have, and he posted some images. And, and you're, uh, you're right. I did, because we had this VHS tape of a lot of the movie in raw yeah. form, I was able to take that Shredder moment, which up until then was like one grainy photo somewhere that suggested there was some moment where Shredder sits on the, tata the tatami mat floor. Um, and that was in the, it was in the, the storyboards. It was in the script. So people kn knew that it was there. Um, and so I was able to take the raw footage, cut it together as it was in the storyboards and put it in the film. I can see why they cut it, to be honest. It okay. didn't really show Shredder being awesome. It sort of just, he just sort of like shook his arms a bit. And then, <laughs> and, and, and the guys were like, oh! Well, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A cartoon, right? I, could, I could totally, I could totally see why they cut it. Cause it didn't really work. Um, I've talked to Steve many times, um, Steve Barron, about um, what was to be shot, what wasn't shot, what was his intentions. I hope that in this release, especially with this this goal we've already achieved, where we're going to bring Steve in for um, this commentary, that we can kind of put some of it to bed because I think that there's a lot of conjecture. I think there's a lot of rumor. I think there's a lot of like, this could have happened. Did this happen? The farm scene is the biggest one. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to know what happened at the farm scene people used to say why is it Raphael's voice over michelangelo standing on the barn roof? yep and and that question wasn't answered back then and then it was oh there does seem to be an alternate version of this film where michelangelo was taking splinter's loss more seriously then they and the edit it became more about Raphael. um so i can see why the filmmakers made the choice 
to change it to Raphael being the one, the voice on the roof. It was a choice. It was a mistake. Um, to be honest with you, I know I'm dancing around it. Unfortunately, in that tape, the farm's footage is not in it. Okay. There is a good chunk of the movie. There are other deleted scenes or alternate takes or moments in that footage. The farm scene's not in there. So I can't confirm that they did, in fact, shoot that sequence with the blindfold sideways and, and that kind of thing. As a filmmaker, as somebody who works in this business, not just as a documentarian, but also in narrative film, I, I could look at what is in the movie and I can look at what was on Steve Barron's um, additional do, to be shot list. He had like stuff he wanted to get to. I can look at the raw footage and I can say, I'm going to ask him this when we do the, the, the voiceover or the, um, the commentary. I'm going to ask him about the farm scene. I want to see if he can remember if they did record dialogue spoken parts in the farm if if i was going to guess i would look at the farm footage and say it looks more like they were just shooting flavor like here's the turtles training and there really wasn't a story part going on i know it is scripted that way whether they did or didn't might have come down to time because they didn't have a lot of time making that movie and a lot of things got dropped because they just ran out of time so there are ways it was in the script that isn't the way it is in the movie. And as a filmmaker, I look at it and go, that's because you ran out of time that day. You couldn't keep shooting. So you got a quick shot of the, the four turtles going, you know, it's time to go back. When really Todd Langdon's script would have had a, a, a moment where they showed some ninja move and then said, and then Casey says, I hate it when you do that, um, which happened at a different time in the movie. Um, and they're like, it demonstrated their cool new ninja skills that they've just been training. So, whether or not they shot it, I can't confirm yet. I hopefully will be able to get that answer. I don't have that footage, but that specific scene has been a, um, a big, one of the big mysteries. Did that happen? Didn't it happen? What would have it been like? But I think, by and large, the rest of the film, looking at the dailies, there wasn't a tremendous amount that was different. So a lot of people complain, why, is, why haven't they put out the special edition extra release? As far as we know, there is no such thing. Nobody, none of the studios have a different version of the film locked in some vault, as far as we can tell. I hate to be the bearer of bad yeah. news. So what, what we delivered in the first documentary, Turtle Part 1, and what we are delivering with this one is quite literally your bonus content. That is your behind the scenes. That is the only time anybody is going to be able to interview half those people. The only time any of the behind the scenes footage has ever been released that, we, that anybody's ever found is what Peter filmed. That's it. Like the bonus feature is what we've already created. So, so many people will be like, I'm going to wait until they do this. I'm like, there probably never are. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is no other version of this film somewhere. Um, we have a Blu ray. That is what it is. Right. Um, there's maybe a few little things here and there that they could add. I'm not saying it will never happen. Um, crazier things have happened, but take it from somebody who has had to down the rights to use that fo the film footage in the first documentary. It's a mess. It's, it's not, not likely, likely that that one's going to. And by talking to all these people, and, and again, it's been thirty, almost 35 years now since the movie's been released. So, yes, so for, for those listening now, this is as good as you're going to get in regards to a like director's cut with all this extra scenes. Because, again, it's a four-hour film, but there is loads of extra you know, content coming yeah. out on this Blu-ray yeah, and digital. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's why, that's why it's like a lot of people have said, why don't you just put it on one Blu-ray? You can't physically fit that many hours into a Blu-ray. You can't just stuff it in there. So that's why you have to have many discs. And, and for every new disc, that's another glass master. That's another package. It's a large process to replicate. So with hours and hours and hours and hours of bonus features that we're releasing, it's going to take a lot of discs. So that's why if you want, now there's a digital copy, obviously, yeah. which is cheaper. Sure. Uh, but if you want that, you said collectors, we're, we're toy collectors. We yeah. like to have, there's a bunch of toys exactly. and Ghostbusters and everything, right? So you go, you know, if you want that physical thing, this is a cool way to, to get that. And can you talk more about this book too? That I didn't, Like a coffee book you guys are going to be uh, also released with the yeah. Kickstarter? This sounds really yeah, cool, is, actually. Yeah, look, this is... Um, Almost like it's a second uh, visual history of the turtles here. That's right. I'm this, this isn't it. what it, this isn't this was, isn't literally it. But this is like yeah. I slapped the cover on another book. Sure. But, you know, a, a big coffee table book. I just want to show it as a reference. Yeah, this is, it's know, incredible. Big coffee table book. We've got images that we've collected or scanned or shot or products or stories. So it's sort of like a read along to the documentary um, that basically tracks the evolutionary history of the turtles in book form. 
and our stories and other people's stories in that book that'll look that'll look at it as well so it's a great companion piece because who doesn't like a coffee table book to hold your coffee table down so exactly. I, I, have, I have many of them yeah it's like you know if you got the chips you might as well have the salsa to go with it too so i think it's a great add-on for uh, people again and you know most turtle you know collectors we want everything which is why you're giving us everything from head to yep. toe um and, and I've, said, I've said that for years on the technodrome i used to say we'll eventually give this to everybody and they would be like now, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And I'm like, well, when it when the time is right, and now the time is right, we're gonna say, here you go, here you go, world, take it off. Yeah, exactly. Now, again, you guys have been working on this since you know almost ten years ago. So for uh, us video gamers, I know you probably don't have Shredder's Revenge in here, but do you have more of the retro video games like the Nintendo, you know, uh, games like the arcade? I know it was briefly touched on in the first documentary. Did you, were you able to talk to anybody from Konami or anything like that for the That's... video game department? So, so I, I hate to to burst the bubble, but that was that was that was probably the hardest thing to do because okay. we actually did another documentary on a Sega Dreamcast game and franchise um, called Shenmue. We did that one and we shot part Shenmue. of that in Japan, and and that we shot that in Japan, and and, and you kind of start to see how hard it is to navigate video game history inside Japan um, in terms of. That, you know, language barrier. Yeah. <laughs> you know, finding people. You know, it's a, it's a different scenario. So we, in this film, we are trying our best to cover as much, if not all, of elements as we go. And and in the past, we've restricted ourselves to not talk about something if we don't have interviews about it, because we don't have a host and we don't have narrators. Now this time, we're probably going to change that format. Be able to talk about things um, without having all the access. That said. Um, I can't promise anything, but I'm pretty sure that some of the, the later, the, the, you mentioned Spider's Revenge, I think some of the later um, video games are actually produced in Montreal. So um, that's not very far. Well, Canada's huge. Right. It's within Canada, so I can I can get there. Um, uh, if, if, they, if they agree to talk to us during the process of completing this film, I would love to include include interviews with them directly as well. So yes, we're going to talk about it. Yes, we'll bring in video game experts, and yes, we'll explore as much of the video game history as we can to look at that aspect of the of the franchise as well um unfortunately i don't think in this budget we're going to fly to japan and get <laughs> gotcha <laughs> and get more <laughs> very true um so well, this this documentary is going to expand more though on ones that weren't really covered as much again due to timing in the first act so we're going to hear more like you said rise the nickelodeon show the two yeah. the fact the 2003 show is going to be in there yeah. um any more in depth with the uh, coming out of their shells tour? I know you guys touched on that in the first. Was there any more like extra with that also the rock and roll tour they did? No, we're we're, we're trying we're trying our best to get so we've tracked down some of them. I'm, again, okay. they're, they're on my list of I have a high priority list of ones I want to bring into this. Film. Okay. Um, well, again, we'll talk, we'll cover more of it. Um, more specifically, the stuff we have already shot that wasn't in the first one is like you know we got Mike Pressman and Stuart Gillard, the directors of the second and third movie. We've got. Uh, Kevin Monroe, a great guy for, who directed the TMNT 2007 film. Like we've got all all of those elements too that weren't in the first doc. So those have already been captured. You know, we've we've been with um, Eric Allard from All Effects and looked at exactly how he adapted Henson's film um, Henson suits into the third movie suit, which was a whole process um, for them to come in and have to do that. So a lot of that stuff we've got in the second doc where we can cover. You know, you know, Secret of the Years and the third film and the fourth film and. Uh, and uh, um, expectation, and all what of all those things would have happened, and and yeah, the Chiodo brothers in there who created the suits for the, the expectation, you know, all that stuff we've got. So so we'll be building on all of that, and what we don't have, either I'm trying to get or experts will talk about. Excellent. And uh, real quick, can you plug us your YouTube channel because I came across it yesterday before I was going to talk to you guys today, and I see. Yeah. Can you? How did you guys get this storyboard? For the old Ninja Turtles serial, that is on your YouTube channel right now. If people want to check out the storyboard and the original commercial. How did you guys find that? <laughs> well, this is just it. I mean, we 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 ended up with sort of stacks of VHS tapes that were from different people. And I mean, if you can imagine, like let's say pretend you guys, let's say pretend you invented yeah. the turtles, and it starts showing up on TV, and it starts showing. So you're, you're like recording with your new brand new VHS tape yeah. system in, in 1987, and going. Oh man, we're on the news again. Let's record it. So there was a bunch of stuff that these guys, like Mirage guys, had collected, including stuff that they would be sent. So they would be sent the commercial rough, for instance, or um, the internal corporate video that Christie's Cookies would make about this year's uh, stats on cookie sales is going to go up because of Ninja Turtle. And they like they would have these dates. 
So um, stuff that I've been sort of putting out on our YouTube channel is also going to be stuff that will be on bigger parts of the archive where you can just be like, okay, let's watch all the car commercials. Let's watch all this. Um, let's watch the appearance on the movie awards in 1990 where there was a different version of coming – of. Uh, was it coming out of their shells or pizza power? A different version of the pizza power song, which I released on, on YouTube as well. Cause it was like, wow, has anybody seen this? <laughs> there's, there's like this, they were like the coming out of the shells suit at a movie awards ceremony doing a different version of the song. So I was like, let's put that in. So like, there's all this stuff we found that that will be other just flavor bonus stuff that we're going to throw into the discs that are just like, look at this. And that's why like I had the storyboards for some of the yogurt commercials and stuff and, or the, first pencil passes of the animation of the bird king so i i just married them together with the finished commercial so it would look cool yeah i, mean, I hope you guys should. so is it definitive films that I, i'm gonna post it when i put the this on youtube yeah. uh, isaac okay that's how and it, it's like almost every week you guys are popping up something new too to just get more and more hype for this trying to yeah like trying well it's actually to be honest it's just finding time if i have time i've got three kids in a toy store that i run so it's like everything is busy so if i i'm just trying to put it as much as i can to keep you know, hype and put it out online and um, also to to point to like, you know, this is, this is like, there's mountains of this stuff that's going to be in these discs, like just mountains of it. So, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully people see that before we run out of time next week and, uh, and say, you know, let's get, let's get on, let's get on board. Yeah. Kickstarter officially closed October 14th, I believe, right? That's the last day we can make a pledge. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, and we can, and again, if you don't want, if you guys just want to support this, you know, Cause you guys can pledge as little as a dollar USD too, right? I think that's the minimum. If anybody just wants to throw yeah. a couple bucks in to help you guys, because like yeah. I said, you guys travel. I've heard in other interviews, you actually got you guys for the first doc. Weren't you guys sleeping in Kevin Eastman's like spare house or something too? Right? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we, I can finally take those off. Actually, uh, the uh, that's true. When we first did, I mean, this is the thing. Yeah, and I think thank you for pointing that out. Is yeah. that um, like we make these out of our pockets. Like it's not like we're a studio. We're not a big, we're not NECA. We're not Paramount. We're just three guys from rural Ontario. And so where, when we did the first film, we didn't know what to expect. And we fly out to LA and we said, well, we need a place to film. We don't have a space to bring all the voice cast together. We need a place to stay. Um, we didn't want to, you know, hotels were expensive. Um, and so Kevin was selling one of the like, house he had in the Hollywood Hills. And he's like, yeah, I mean, you just, you just live here and you can, there's no furniture in it, <laughs> no beds, no chairs. We didn't, couldn't sit down for a week, but uh, we bought some inflatable mattresses from Walmart and, and we set up some lights and, and stuff in the, in, in his old living room <laughs> and, um, and got all of the voice cast together. And it was a great moment when James Avery walked in and he's like, this is this is your craft table like craft is what we call like your snack table yeah. in the film this is your craft table like yeah it's like there's a there's one donut we could cut it in seven if you want <laughs> you know like it was like you know what shoestring as we are it's like here we are we're just doing this out of our out of our pockets and our credit cards and trying our best and and we were lucky to get the first film out under paramount but you know we've got 10 years ago and we yeah. just never stopped so you know that's, that's a cool fun fact. So, so that whether you're interviewing the voice actors from the original cartoon, that's in Kevin's spare house. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah, it was it was a house that he was it was a house he lived in, and he was selling it. He was chain, he was moving and stuff like that. It was that that house was built by Alex Van Halen. I think the, one of the Van Halen albums was recorded in the backyard. It was like a, a studio under the pool or something. Um, he bought it from somebody else, but yeah, it was uh, it was wild. It, like that was one of those moments where, as a filmmaker. And as a you know, as a historian or whatever you want to say, you know, you go out and you're like, that experience was like, it's never going to get cooler than this. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's all downhill from here. You know, no hotel is going to match an air mattress on this floor in this mansion. <laughs> oh gosh, I I got a couple more questions. I know you got to go in about uh, thirty minutes. So, yeah. what made you guys persevere and push through? I mean, because I, I'm. I'll be honest, if I was you, I don't know if I would have kept going. I mean, it's like I say, through all the years, you know, from April 1st, 2016, starting with this one, you know, there had to be a few times where you guys were like, F this, I can't do it, but you, all three of you guys stuck together. So what made yeah. you guys like, you know, hang in there just to make sure, no, we're going to get this through. And now finally in 2024, you know, all those Turtle fans have the opportunity to see what you guys, you know, work, put your heart and soul into. Well, basically, yeah, timing is everything um and, I, and, I, and it sucks i'm i'm definitely the youngest and most impatient of our of our company 
Um, so I do tend to want to. Oh, let's just do it. Let's just get it out. Let's just do this. Why haven't we done this yet? Um, we've done many other things um, in that time. Um, other films. We, you know, after Turtle Power, um, we immediately started Turtle Power One. We immediately started shooting Conan the Barbarian. We we haven't released that one yet. But watch for that one coming this year, hopefully. Um, we we did a Kickstarter. Uh, it was like 2016, 2017. We did. Um, Kickstarter for a Masters of the Universe documentary. Um, that one came out and, That's a and, good one. and I like went, that one. and that was Power Grace Call. And then on the back of that, we got um, an internal Netflix job where where we didn't develop it ourselves. We were hired to do the behind the scenes documentary, which was an hour long, hour long standalone film on the history and internal making of the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance series with Jim Henson. Um, so that was fantastic. I mean, talking yeah, about a life, life experience, we, that, 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 that series was all filmed in the UK. So, you know, 10 hour series of all puppets, like it was the most epic thing I've ever seen. And we were in literally actual literal trenches where the puppeteers are, you know, we were in the trenches with them. Um, and that was a fantastic experience. So we've, we've stayed together and learned and grown, uh, grown as a company and as friends and as business partners for, 15 years now, the three of us, and, you know, we've developed a small um, post-production studio in rural Ontario, Canada, where we've done, um, we do, my business partner, Mark Hussey, and, and another one of our colleagues, Curtis Lobb, have um, a post-production editing company there, and they do uh, editing of major films. They, did, they just did Blackberry, which is a massive film. Uh, they, they edited that there. Uh, so, yeah, we've built up a little... Uh, you know, community and enterprise around my, when we, when, during the pandemic, we were filming another documentary just prior to the pandemic um, on the history of Baywatch. And I was the main shooter for the Baywatch documentary series is now out on Disney. And um, so I had shot, ha you know, half that series and then we were scheduled to continue to shooting it. Uh, but then the pandemic happened, so we couldn't travel. So that film continued on, on its own. But during the time of, of the pandemic, I bought the building I'm sitting in here is a 150 year old, old um, condemned hotel that was built pre-turn of the century and I completely rebuilt it and put a toy store in it. So there's a toy store and a toy museum and this this creative creative space, which is a mess. Uh, and then this is where the toy factories will be built for, or are being built or are for these. So that's where these things will be made. Um, so there's this little tiny village in the middle of nowhere, just about 90 minutes north of Detroit um, that has um, a toy museum. <laughs> Is. So, uh, yeah. toy. That, I gotta check that out one day. I hope you post a picture of that on Instagram. I'd like to see some of those toys that yeah. are in there. Yeah, you, go, you, go, you go to go to Village Toy Castle on Instagram. You can see it. Village, oh, excellent! So now you guys are also like the Kevin Ka Clash of Splinter for 15 years now. We've been working together. <laughs> I've thought that this whole year. Ever since we got into, I can finally say for 15 years. Yeah, exactly. You can do it, Masters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So for those listening now, what advice can you give those who follow their passions and have to overcome these roadblocks like you guys have? I mean, putting this together has not been easy. Essentially, you know, people have lived their whole elementary school life, you know, for eight, nine years pretty much. So what advice can you give those listening now to just hang in there and, you know, good things will come if you stick with it? You know, there's, there's some great, you know, potatoodle one-liners that you know, I think it was like Adam Sandler or something that said it maybe once that, it was something like that it was like you know everyone in a creative industry can be successful if you don't give up and that's such a you know it's a flippant statement to go like just don't give up but the truth is doesn't mean the success doesn't mean you're going to make a living necessarily it depends on your definition of success well I struggle with that personally um I don't have another mode I can't not do a creative thing i would be I, i've never had i haven't had a real job since high school and i don't think i did a very good job at it at the time so i've always done something like this and it, it, it can be a slog and it can be really hard and there's a lot of dedication and you have to have the right people and the right partners both you know personally and, and business around you you shouldn't do it alone you can't do it alone um and it's uh it is it's it's it's, it's it has it's hard, but it's rewarding because I can't I can't see myself doing anything else. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not good enough at anything else to to you know go be a plumber or something. I would just fail miserably at it because I'd be too busy thinking about other stuff. As a matter of fact, I'll put it like this: When I was film business, you can do what's called what I call teching or grunt work, where you're like 
you're pulling cable and putting up lights, you're a dapper, you're a grip. And and when I would work in those those part like coming in up in the film industry and you're working on a commercial for Pizza Hut or some other thing, and you go, I'm out there working, and I would be always trying to think seven steps ahead of what I was doing. And the truth is that if you're at, you know, if you're just doing that, if you're grunting, you're not supposed to think. You're supposed to just do what they want you to do. So I would constantly be yelled at. Be going like, stop it. Stop thinking. If you just keep your mouth shut and did your job, you'd be fine. And I wasn't ever going to be good at that. <laughs> so, so I was like always just going to get yelled at. So, And I don't like being yelled at. So I here I am. I do my own thing. So I think that there is a, a, a place for all of us. And I do believe that we absolutely have to have those people who are good at the grunt job, who are good at doing the things we need to do. But if you have passions, it doesn't matter if you want to make them into a business. Just do them. Just, just have fun. Well, I, and including many other Turtle fans, are thanking you three for just the hard work that you guys have done for the first doc. This one coming out, I'm very excited for. Uh, so, Isaac, to you, what makes the Ninja Turtle fan base and franchise just so unique and so special? Because just for all these interviews for everybody to come together, I mean, again, you guys aren't, you know, you're not Nickelodeon, you're not, you're just three, you know, regular dudes who love Ninja Turtles. So, you know, what does this franchise mean to you and the community as a whole? You know, it's, it's what's fascinating about the franchise and, and what's fascinating about, about Turtles in general, and, I, and I'm definitely going to steal from some of the people we've interviewed even recently um, within the last few weeks. You know, when you look at this franchise, um, it has got this, this bizarre dichotomy while being the most indie, grassroots, homemade, black and white, two guys in, in Massachusetts making it themselves, bad printer who made the, not bad, but I mean, yeah. printer screws up and makes it too big. You know, like it is the most independent thing while being the largest, most successful, most pop culture brand in history. So you've got this like reality of it being completely independent and the hugest thing ever. And and it's always made room for creatives. Kevin and Peter, you know, you know these, these amazing dudes um, always made room for collaboration because i mean you think about it what other franchise property comic book thing maybe what one or two films maybe are really truly the product of two people right of two creators working so intrinsically hand in hand especially in comic books yes we can say you know stan lee and jack kirby but you know what stan lee made all the money and took all the credit jack kirby died for you know they they these two guys were, you didn't see where one guy stopped drawing a pencil and the other guy inked because it was both of them. Everything was both of them. So that spirit of collaboration and homage and the fact that turtles themselves are based on the things they liked has always given this property this freedom to mutate and evolve just like the turtles do and become something new for the new audience. And that is kept it alive for you know for 40 years is that it's been allowed to grow where other things have had bumps and starts and not maybe not even come back um you know and it could have been just as easily a forgotten property what if they made all shredders bad guys humans and that didn't click and didn't work in a cartoon that we would have said oh hey remember jason and the wheel of warriors i wonder why they didn't do that again um you know like it's it could have been just another one of those so I think that, that this one has got a very unique magic to it. And Kevin would point out it's happy accidents. It's all of these things that are just serendipity. And we as three, you know, dudes from the middle of nowhere are, are fed into and became part of that community and that franchise in the same serendipitous, by accident, grassroots, independent, done it ourselves way. And isn't it kind of bizarre that, the three filmmakers that have done the history of the turtles for 15 years literally came at it the same way. And maybe that's what Kevin and Peter saw in us. I don't know. Maybe they saw the same, you know, passion of just three guys trying to do something creative and, and pay tribute to something that, that the world loves. Um, and maybe that's why it worked. I don't know. And to share their story too, with the reunion, again, you guys were the ones that actually had that, you know, first to, to bring them together, which is another extra special moment. So I know you got to go, Isaac. Um, where can people find all, all your uh, social media then for this? You, know, you have your Kickstarter. They can just look up Ninja Turtles Evolution Reboot. Um, where else can we find you? Yeah, even if you type in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Kickstarter, you'll find it there. Okay. Um, 
So I think it's, 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 it's Turtle Power Volume 2 on Facebook or, or just search for um, Definitive Film. Uh, definitivefilm.com. You can find all the links from there uh, out to all of the stuff we do. Um, and uh, Definitive Toys is becoming a very uh, integral part of this. Uh, which, which is associated, associated no, it's a lot of names, but it's associated with the Village Toy Castle, Castle, which is the store I'm sitting in. And so, yeah, there's a many, many ways to find us. We are, we are out there. Awesome. So, yeah, guys, so your homework for today after you're done watching this, we're filming this October 4th. You guys have about another week and a couple days to make sure to support this. Share with any Turtle fan you know, because, again, like we talked earlier, a lot of people don't know what Kickstarter is. So explain to them where this documentary is. Check out the first one on Paramount to get Fall in Love, if you've never seen that one, to get more hype for the second one. Check out their YouTube channel. They have little, you know, Easter eggs all over the place on there. Like we talked about the cereal. There's spots about the second movie on there. And uh, Isaac, thanks so much for your time. Before I let you go, what is your all-time favorite Master Splinter quote from any yeah, any of the series? One. Yeah, yeah, it was a great one because I don't want to I don't want to do the, the cliches as we already did one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of my favorites is um, in 2003, and you have that great one. Where I can't think of the exact line, but it's something about the fact that he's always wanting to watch his story. <laughs> he always wanted to watch soap operas. I'm watching my story. Yeah, right. yeah. Now back to my stories. Yep, exactly. Now, now, gosh, that was such a great voice actor too. What was his name? The the one that voice Splinter. I know it was. I, I think it starts. I can't think of it right now. It's gonna haunt me after the show. But I know. I think it's uh, yeah, him. We, we we interviewed him. We interviewed him. Oh, and I can't wow. think of it. Yeah, it's one of those funny things. It's like, um, he'll be in this. Uh, oh, very I, you know, cool. There's so, many, there's so many names. I feel bad not being able to remember his name off the top of my head. But there was, there was Wayne Grayson. Wayne Grayson was one of those guys. Um, Michael Center Nicholas was one of those guys from that show. We interviewed those guys. Uh, Greg Abbey, Wayne Grayson, Michael Center Nicholas. We got those three. And Greg Abbey, was he one of them? Uh can't remember what the guy's name was. Yeah. He was funner. That's not funny. That was, all, that was on Lloyd, Lloyd Goldfine's show. It was a great show. Oh, yeah. The comments are going to blow up. I caught you guys missed that one. Uh, Isaac, dude, thank you so much. Uh, congrats on hitting the first goal for Kickstarter. I look forward to getting that Steve Barron Dally one hit up before the Kickstarter expires. Hopefully, we get some more goals. And uh, again, next oh, we, week. We, we, have, we have that Steve Barron one. It's the Steve Barner one we want to get oh, to. Oh, Steve Barner. Okay. Get to, so we, we passed it. So that's right. So to remind you, Canadian dollars versus American dollars. We've already passed this. Oh, good. Okay, because on my end, I can't so, see that. Okay, great. Right. So, so when, when, when you when when you uh, look at it, um, when you look at uh, yeah, the the Varner one is uh, that's the one we want to hit to because we Steve Varner has so many prototypes in his archive, and we want to go down there and shoot a mini documentary on him, and that's our our, our top um, three hundred thousand Canadian. If we get to that, we'll we'll, we'll do another tour. And he's the guy to help you with those guys you're sitting next to, right? He helped you with Laird and Easton those figures yeah. too, right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah, Baron. We, we dragged him. Oh, sorry, Barner, Barner, we dragged him out of, uh, out of retirement, kicking and screaming. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Isaac, dude, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to hearing more. And again, on your YouTube channel, you guys have been doing some live Q&As also, right? People can check out. Yeah, for sure. I think Sunday night, uh, this Sunday night, uh, which I don't know what date that is on top of my head, we're doing a, uh, another live Q&A with, uh, with our friend Steve Levine. He'll be on there for Mirage. Uh, so, yeah, and then thank you so much. I mean, you've, you've got some great questions on here. This has been an awesome chat. I really appreciate it. All right, Isaac. Well, have a great Friday, and we'll be in touch soon, man. Look forward to hearing more updates on the Kickstarter. All right, take care. King Mike and the heroes in a half shell. Thanks for listening to Shellonomics. Follow us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video version. Stay tuned for more Ninja Turtles insights.